Father, we do bow before you, and we just thank you for your presence. Lord, we love when you come to us like this, and we just invite invite more of your presence for you just to come into the room, for you to love upon your people, Lord. We just thank you that, that, that it is a time for love, Lord. We thank you for the awakening, Father, to that bridal relationship of the bride that you're doing. Oh, God, we thank you for, for the blossoms are on the vine. That's what I was hearing yesterday, that the blossoms were on the vine. And, Lord, you're bringing a rain. You're bringing a new rain of the Spirit upon, upon your people, and we ask for that. We want that. We want an increase of you. We want you in that bridal relationship. That's the desire, Lord, of each and every heart of everyone here. And, Lord, we thank you for the sweet work that you're doing, that you've been doing, and that you will continue to do until that day, oh God, we rejoice in who you are and what you're doing. And Lord, we do just thank you for the word. We pray, Father, that you would just take Ken out of the way, that you would speak through him, not by power nor by might, but by your spirit. And Father, I pray that you would just bypass his mind and that your spirit would just would just come, Father, like a river, would just flow in and through him. Anything that you want to say, we ask that you say it. We thank you that your words are spirit and life, that it will bring a, not it will bring the spirit as well as an impartation of your life, that we will hear like we've not heard before, Lord. We pray even as he preaches, Lord, and proclaims your word, that you will give us a revelation, an unveiling within us, of all that you mean, Lord, the deeper revelation of covenant, we pray in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Amen. That was really powerful worship this morning. Thank you, worship team. And, and let's give the Lord a praise for that. I mean, that was really, really good, and we encountered God through that. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to continue uh, the series that I started last week on uh, just believing for healing and health. Um, give you a little bit of background, um, yeah, just a little bit of a review, but uh, back actually a little bit over a year ago, like the beginning of 2020, I just really felt the Lord putting uh, really in my heart deeply that we, that his church and our church, we need to kind of refresh our understanding of covenant and begin to walk by covenant because of probably what I'm sensing is, in, is with what's coming in this decade in the world, uh, that it's become more and more important that God's church learn to live by the covenant relationship with, that we have with the Lord. Uh, and so that we can, obviously covenant requires uh, a surrender, complete surrender of our life unto Christ. But it also is, part of that is also gives us permission to draw from him and who he is and what he has accomplished in us and through us, for us. And so we, we want to learn to walk by covenant. And so just a little bit of review. I'm not going to go through it, but uh, I did a two-week service as an overview, a two-week series as an overview of what it means to live by covenant. Uh, and then the three things, three areas that I felt like the Lord has put in my heart that we need to learn to live by is the three areas being learn to live by covenant promises of health and healing, uh, covenant promises of provision, uh, and covenant promises of protection. Uh, and so I had talked to the leadership team that I'd like to do like over the year, this year, I do four like mini series on one on covenant, one on health and healing, one on provision, and one on protection. Uh, not all together, but through uh, throughout the year. And so I did the, I've done the one on overview of covenant. Uh, and then now I'm in this second week of talking about draw, being able to draw from God uh, for health and healing. Because it, it just imagine if the healthcare system gets overwhelmed, if the healthcare system doesn't uh, provide for us, we're going to need to draw more and more and more uh, from God's healing power. 
Uh, and it's there in the scriptures, and we want to learn and refresh our faith for that for whenever it is needed. Uh, and so that's kind of where we've been. Um, last week I began by talking about five different threads that run through scripture uh, that talk about it being God's will that his people uh, live in health, and then when we're not healthy, to be able to call on God for healing. Uh, obviously, not everybody gets healed, uh, but we all get healed when we go to heaven, for sure. But the more we can believe in God's promises for health and healing, uh, the more we'll walk in it now, the more we'll walk in it in this life. And so we want to stir the fresh that that faith to live by covenant promises in this series, the specific promise of living by health uh, and healing. Uh, so that's kind of where we are. And we talked about five, we, we only got through three of the threads. We talked, there are five themes that kind of run through scripture that speak about it being God's will that we live by in health and healing. And we talked about three of them uh, last week. We talked about uh, the fact that because of covenant, we can call on God for health and healing. It's one of the covenant promises, and we won't go back in over these other than just to mention them. But one of them is that we can, we can live, uh, the covenant relationship includes health and healing. The second th theme or thread is that God's character, uh, most of these either start with a C, covenant and character, uh, that God's character uh, and his nature is to heal. We talked about the name Jehovah Rapha uh, and, you know, with the Hebrew names in that, in that day, the name represented not just a, de a designation, but it also represented the nature uh, of, the, of the person. And so part of God's nature is Jehovah, Jehovah Rapha. He says, I'll put none of the diseases of Egypt upon you if you'll walk with me and walk in obedience to me. And then the third one we talked about last week was compassion. We talked about the fact that God is a compassionate God, that when he sees his people in need, now listen to this, this is so important. When he sees his people in need, it stirs his heart, it touches his heart. And it, in many cases, his compassion caused him to heal their diseases. And we looked at a number of scriptures last week where that is the case. God is a compassionate God and wants to touch his people in their areas of need. So those are the three that we looked at last week. I want to touch on two more um, and spend whatever time is there. And then we're going to move from there into talking about closing the door to the enemy. And I, I we probably won't have time to get into all of it, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on as much of it as we can. But I want to hit these in the last two threads of themes that, that it's God's will that we walk in health and healing. The fourth one, and I'll just mention this briefly, the fourth one is the kingdom. The kingdom. Uh, the Lord has put in my heart, uh, I mean it's in the throughout the scriptures, and we've had various seasons where God has done a lot of external miracles, but I really sense that we're entering it into a time where God wants to, as the, as the world system uh, gets darker and darker, God wants to release his glory upon his church, upon his people. And part of that is going to be a demonstration of the kingdom of God uh, to, to the world, uh, to the, the lost, so that people can see a distinction, a clear distinction between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Um, and so... There, the scriptures say that the kingdom does not consist merely of words. It does consist of words. It does consist of our understanding of Christ and, and, uh, and what's involved in the kingdom. But the scriptures speak really clearly that it speaks also of power. The kingdom of God is not merely uh, a kingdom of words, but it's also a kingdom of power. First Corinthians talks about that. And, you know, we were in our uh, home group uh, study a few weeks ago doing First Thessalonians. And chapter 1, I believe it's verse 5, says that I came to you not only in word, but also in power. And if you look at uh, when Paul in Acts 17, when he came to Thessalonians, Thessalonica, and ministered there, there was... Uh, 
uh, quite a turmoil there, but he demonstrated, and part of the reason why it was was because he came not only in word, but he came in power. Uh, and so God wants uh, healing and health as part of his will is a demonstration of the kingdom uh, to the world. But now th this is, I want to hit this next one really, uh, really thoroughly. And that is the cross. Now I save this one for last. Because of the cross, uh, we can walk in health uh, and in healing. You know, we think about Jesus on the cross. And you know, when he was on the cross, for like a three-hour period, the skies turned dark. Darkness came upon uh, the earth. And during that time period, Jesus cried out. He was quoting actually Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was happening then was all of the sin of the world from the time of Adam to throughout the church age was laid upon him. But not only just the sin, all the sickness and all the perversion and all the deprivation of the world. Just think about some of the stuff that's going on right now in the world. Just some of the uh, gender issues and all of that. Just think about some of that stuff. All of that. The sin of all of that. The weight of all of that. The oppression of all that was laid upon Christ. He became the curse. He took the curse of sin and death and the law upon him. That his people might walk in the blessings, Galatians chapter 3, that we might walk in the blessings of God, but not subject to the curses. What a powerful, powerful thing. The cross, the power of the cross. Our Lord, our Savior, he paid the price of the cross. Taking the sin, taking the perversion. But a part of that, getting back to our theme, he took sickness upon the cross. He took sickness upon the cross. Let let's look at Isaiah 53. I've got like seven pages of notes of scriptures here, which um, I, the Lord just kind of began to speak to me during the worship. That we're not going to get to all that, but that's okay. Uh, but Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 through 6. I, now, you know, Isaiah 53 is that, that chapter that talks prophetically about, about Jesus and the, his death on the cross and all that took place there. But I want to I want to focus in on healing and health in the power of the cross. Uh, Isaiah 53, verse 4. This is in the New American Standard. Uh, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried away. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being, fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. But the Lord has called the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. When he was on the cross, that took place. Now, I want to focus on verse 4. New American Standard, which most of us probably use, says, surely our grief he himself bore. But if you look at it in the New uh, International Version, it reads this way. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Now, that word griefs in the New American Standard or infirmities uh, in the NIV, I want to make sure we understand that. Because that word, that Hebrew word that's in the New American Standard is translated griefs, that word, that Hebrew word, appears 24 times in the Old Testament. Now, out of those 24 times of the Old Testament, 22 of those 24 times 
that word is translated infirmity or sickness or something related to, to sickness. Two times it's, it's translated griefs. Uh, and so I think we can easily, and I'll show you another confirmation of that here in just a minute, but we can see that there is part of what Jesus did on the cross. This is what I want you to see. Part of what Jesus did on the cross includes he paid the price for sicknesses, for, for sicknesses and uh, for disease and for uh, infirmity. Also in that verse, it says that surely our, so our sicknesses he himself bore. That word, uh, I like to use this term, that word in the Hebrew is NASA, N-A-S-A. And I think about the uh, National, is it National Aeronautical and Space Administration, uh, NASA. But what that word means is not just bore, but bore it to take it away. Bore it to take it away. The same word is used in Leviticus chapter 16 when they talk about the scapegoat. You know, the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement, uh, what would happen, the high priest would lay all the sins of the people on one of the goats and send that into the wilderness, and then they would sacrifice the other goat. Uh, and so it was called the scapegoat who got away. But what they did, they sent away... They laid the sin and all that and sent it away into the wilderness, never to be seen or heard from again. Now, that's the same word in Leviticus 16, NASA, uh, as it is here in Isaiah chapter 53. He took it away. Just like a rocket, NASA sent in a rocket ship into outer space. That's what it says here, that he took, he bore our sin, he bore our sicknesses to take them away. Amen? Amen? Now, but there's even better news than that. I mean, not necessarily better, but confirmation of that. Matthew 18, verse 14 through 17. I want to, this is confirmation that he's speaking here, included in what he's saying here is health and healing. Matthew chapter 8, verse 14. When Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. Uh, he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and waited on him. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were ill. So he did... So he healed Peter's mother-in-law and he healed a lot of other people who came to him. Verse 17. This was to fulfill what was spoken to Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Isn't that good news? So this is a, a New Testament confirmation spoken by Christ himself that Isaiah 53, verse 4, is speaking about God putting our sickness on him at the cross and taking it away. Now, obviously the cross in Isaiah 53 talks a lot about sin and other things uh, as well. But the point I want to make is, you know, part of these five threads, the cross, the cross includes God's taking away our sicknesses. Yeah. You know, I, this is, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but during the worship, the Lord just put this in my heart. I, to sh go ahead and share. I've been, this whole week and last week too, I've been, I'm writing that for the Forerunner School, I'm writing this class on the theology of the bride where we take some of the stuff that was in the, the A Worthy Bride book and, and some other things and go deeper into it. And so I, this whole week or two, I've been looking at the Jewish wedding practices and, the, and during the ancient uh, days, during biblical days, and trying to see the parallel between those practices and what took, pl took place when Christ came to earth. And even, even going back to Abraham and, and even Mount Sinai and the, the giving of the law on Mount, on Mount Sinai, all that is related uh, to that. But 
going back to the, the practices of an ancient Jewish wedding, uh, there was a, there's a lot of things, I won't go into all of it here, but uh, there was a betrothal ceremony and then a year later there was the actual marriage ceremony. Uh, but here, here's what I, the point I want to bring out. Uh, in those ancient days, the groom-to-be and the father of the groom, they had to come up with a dowry in order to purchase a wife. I mean, it sounds kind of, uh, I mean, it's not like purchasing property, okay? I mean, it wasn't like that in those days. Certainly it wouldn't be now. But they had to, they had to get a wife, to take a wife. They had to purchase uh, that wife, and they had to, to uh, issue uh, a dowry. And so there was a purchase price uh, for that wife. Uh, and we see that, that what Christ did in order to betroth you and me to him, he had to, he had to uh, pay a dowry. And that dowry was his life. The ultimate price the ultimate dowry. And out of that, remember it was to purchase a wife. He purchased you. He purchased you. He purchased me from the slave market, redeemed us from the slave market, and transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. That we might be his betrothed. And part of what he did, part of that purchase price, going back to our topic for today, is he part of the price he died that we might live. He took sickness that we might walk in health. Amen. Isn't that a powerful, powerful truth? So there's another scripture. I wasn't planning on sharing this either, but the Lord wanted me to bring this up. It went a lot right along with Bethany's prophetic song there at the end about rest, and I forgot exactly how it went. But um, from Song of Songs, uh, chapter one, yeah, chapter one, verse uh, twelve. While the king was at his table. My perfume gave forth its fragrance, and my, and my beloved is to me a pouch of myrrh which lies all night between my breasts. And we could go on, but the point here, this is where the bride, the, the myrrh is that burial spice that has a bitter taste that was put on people when they died, uh, but it has a beautiful fragrance. It's what she's doing. She's talking about every night I lay this, this pouch of myrrh from my groom, my bridegroom, on my heart to think of him and all that he's done. The myrrh being a picture of the cross. The bridegroom, Solomon, being a picture of Christ. Us being a, the believer. And that's the way God wants us to live. He wants us to hold in our heart what Christ did for us at the cross. That pouch of myrrh upon our heart. Now, it's a lot more than healing. I mean, healing in one sense is just a secondary issue. Unless you're, unless you're sick, then it's not so secondary. Um, but he wants us to live that way. Meditating on our hearts in our life, in our heart, day and night, it, it's on, the, on the benefits. Now, you know, there's, as you go on through Song of Psalm, Songs, she had to go to the cross. But this is talking about how she, on her heart, what Christ did, the pouch of myrrh that, of, of Christ and what he sacrificed. And as it relates to health and healing, that's how we want, he wants us to live. Not only health and healing, obviously, but he wants us to be able to say, to him that you, Lord, provided you, at your cross. You, you redeemed me from also the curse of sickness. That's how he, he wants us to live. Now, you know, probably 
every one of us in here have some sort of infirmity of some sort or some fashion. Maybe not the younger ones. But, you know, you get up to my age, you've got uh, quite a number. You've got a little list of things. And, you know, probably most of us will die with something there. But I'll tell you this, we'll live in a lot more health. We'll live in a lot more of God's healing power if we'll learn to hold on to the covenant promises that God is our healer and that God is our health, that he provides that as part of his covenant. I've seen it in my own life. and I mean, I've got things that I still need to get healed from. But I've seen it in my own life. I've seen so many times where as I have abided and I have said, uh, Lord, you are my healer. I've got this issue here. You know, sciatic nerve, torn ligament or whatever, something in my shoulder. A uh, number of other issues. And God has delivered me from those things. And he will you too. But he wants us to, to settle once and for all. Devil's bad, God is good. Yeah. The devil causes sickness, God heals. That's, the, that's the, the issue. That's what he wants. And you know, he wants us to get to that point that we believe. John 10, 10, the devil came, the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. God came to give us life and give it abundantly. Jesus, Acts 10, 38, Jesus went about uh, healing the sick and delivering people from the oppression of the devil. It wasn't God who put the oppression on people. It was the devil. Jesus went about delivering people from that. It's a different mindset. And that's where God wants us, uh, as, we, as we learn to walk by covenant, not that we'll get healed every time, and not that it's, it's not a formula, it's not a set of rules and principles, but it's a mindset. It's a mindset where God says, I want you to believe that not only did Christ at the cross deliver me from, from sin and transfer me from the kingdom of sin to the kingdom of righteousness, but he also, he also set me free from, uh, from the, the issue of having to struggle with sickness so that I can walk in health and healing. God loves you, and God does not want you to be battered with sickness and disease all throughout your life. You need, we all need to get to that mindset and hold that pouch of myrrh, hold that pouch of myrrh on our heart day and night that includes far more than healing and health, but it definitely includes that. That's God's will for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that, that's a shift. Uh, you know, I mean, just in my own personal uh, testimony of that, you know, I mean, I believe that even long before we even started the church. So back into the 80s, I, I believed uh, that God was our healer and I confessed it and I declared it. But really what happened with me is I kind of got uh, away from focus on that uh, because there were other issues. But I believe what God is saying to me and I think to all of us is he wants to rekindle to rekindle that faith. You know, just we talked about Hosea chapter 6 uh, last week about God has torn us and now he's going to heal us. And so we, we've been through so much brokenness and all of that over the years. Uh, you know, some, it's so easy to lose that faith for the promises of God. But God is saying, it's time that they be restored. Amen, amen, amen. That's what he wants to do. This is where we are right now in that season. Now, he won't, uh, I won't be able to get to all these, but what, what I want to talk about next is closing the door to the enemy. Uh, you know, there's believing for things, but there's also in the scriptures a number of things that opens the door to our having sickness and disease. And he wants us to close the door to those things. So I, I think I'll touch on... Uh, hopefully all of them, but I, I want to, there's several of them that I really feel like may be really applicable to us as a, as a fellowship, to individuals here. Because I want us to do that. I want us to close that door 
uh, so that as we pray for people and as you walk in uh, for, for healing by your own covenant relationship with the Lord, the door will have been closed. Very important uh, that we do that. Uh, so I've got seven of them, and I, I won't take time to go th- much time on each of the, of the seven. Uh, but we need to close, these are things we need to close the door to. You know, in Ephesians chapter 4, I think it's verse 26, Paul said, you know, do not let the sun set on your anger because you give the devil an opportunity if you do that. Uh, and so we need to close that door to sin or, and a variety of issues. And so the first one is sin and willful rebellion. Sin, we need, and I, I don't sense there's anybody walking. I, I mean, you know, all of us sin. Everybody sins and falls short of the glory of God. But I don't sense that there's anybody here in willful rebellion. But if you look at, if you look at the scriptures, uh, the, there those that are walking in willful rebellion, God will, will turn you over to the devil uh, to bring you back, uh, you know, in, some, in Paul's writings. And some, a lot of that's general stuff. It, it doesn't necessarily say sicknesses, although in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul's talking about taking the Lord's Supper and communion. And he's talking about that if you're uh, in sin, and you take, a, take that, it causes sicknesses and even death in some. That's, yeah, I'm not going to turn to all these just for time's sake, but 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and toward around in the 20s, somewhere in that uh, section of the verse. Now, I don't, that doesn't mean we have to live in fear of taking communion. I don't want us to do, do that. But at the same time, there, it is a solemn thing, and if we uh, there, it's very important that we really do examine ourselves as we partake of communion and confess our sins and repent uh, of our sins. So that's one of the things. If, you know, if, if people are walking in, in outright rebellion uh, to the Lord and, and claiming to be of Christ, but yet walking in rebellion, there's a need to repent of that and, and to turn away from those things because that can be a door. Uh, that the enemy can use to bring sickness upon you. Now, God will allow it at times. Obviously, from the Scriptures, will allow it for, for that. So sin uh, and willful rebellion. Now, this is the second one. This is one I really feel like the Lord said we need to really, I don't know who it would have pertained to, but we really need to hit this one. And this is bitterness and unforgiveness. Bitterness and unforgiveness. Bitterness and unforgiveness can be a wide open door uh, to disease and sickness coming into your life. Uh, You can see it, you know, you can can see it in a general sense in the the Lord's Prayer. You know, forgive those uh, debtors. um, How's it go? Who can help me? Forgive, uh, Father, forgive me of my sins or my debts as I forgive those uh, who have sinned against me. Uh, you know, so there's a sense of forgiveness. But really where I wanted to hit to and get to is Matthew 18, starting with verse 21. Um, and let me just read into my seven pages of scriptures here that I won't get to. Here we go. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. There's a, there's a really important parable about forgiveness there. Uh, and everybody ought to get familiar with it. Uh, but, you know, it started out where Peter came to Christ and he said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Uh, up to seven times. Uh, and Jesus said, no. I say to you, uh, not, not to say to you up to seven times, but to 70 times seven times. In other words, you continually forgive those who have come against you. And then he goes on to tell a parable about two people, one who didn't forgive, who had been forgiven, but they didn't forgive another. Now that's, see, that's us. We have been forgiven. Jesus forgave us of all the sins that we sinned against him. So he's saying because of that, no matter what somebody has done to you, you need to forgive them. You need to walk in forgiveness of them. But here's what I want you to see. Verse 34. And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers 
until he should repay all that was owed to him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. So forgiveness and, uh, and bitterness uh, can cause a wide open door to the torturer, the enemy. And part of that can be sickness and infirmity. Uh, here's, I would say this. For unforgiveness is when we have the, the un, we're, uh, we have not actually forgiven somebody. Bitterness, unforgiveness can turn to bitterness when that is prolonged. Where we, where it's gone on so long that we're, there's resentment and there's hatred and there's all sorts of these kinds of issues. When that happens, there's a door open to the enemy. And part of the things that can happen with that is infirmity and sickness. Now, I've seen it. I've been doing this for a long time now. I've seen it in people's lives. I remember years and years ago, and some of you would know the name, but um, there was somebody in our church that had cancer. And the Lord spoke to me that there was an issue of bitterness in their marriage between the person and the spouse. And I spoke to him about it. And I wish I'd have, you know, looking back on it, I was just started pastoring when this all this happened. Now I would have been a little bit more uh, clear what I was saying, but I was trying to be subtle. And what happened was the one who really needed to deal with it blamed the other one, and the other one blamed the other one. Uh, but that person, uh, you know, didn't make it. But it was bitterness that was causing that. And I'm convinced that bitterness can cause can keep people from being healed of cancer. I, I really believe a lot of the arthritic uh, issues are related to unforgiveness and bitterness. You know, not, I mean, there can be natural reasons for all of these things. I'm not saying that's the only reason, but that is an, an open door. It's really important if, there's, if you have unforgiveness in your heart towards somebody else or bitterness toward them that you forgive them. Now, that's hard to do. That's hard to do. But choose to do it with your will to the degree you can. I remember, you know, the, probably the hardest area of unfor our forgiveness that Donna and I had to deal with, there was a person at our church uh, that, I won't go into the details, but as a result of that person's involvement in our church, probably over half, maybe up to two-thirds of the church uh, left. And we've never gotten back to the same number that was there, and I was angry. I mean, probably hatred even of that person. But finally, you know, we went and we took, actually took communion with that person and said, okay, it's under the bridge. It's under the, you know, the water under the bridge is gone. And from that point forward, I began to be healed from it. Um, and it took a while. It took um, maybe probably years, really. But it got to the point where I could see that person at the grocery store or something like that and, uh, you know, and be friendly with them and not feel that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, do not like you feeling, you know. But it's really important. It's really important. It's really important. And so if, there's, if you're harboring any of that, I really believe the Lord even wants to minister to that uh, today. It's to set us free from that bitterness and unforgiveness. I'm going to go through all of these others quicker. Um, okay, this next one is a, is a big one, I believe, too, for some. Uh, the third open door is either general demonization or also a spe specific spirit of infirmity. 
a spirit, spirit of infirmity. Um, now, it just demonization in general uh, can be an open door to in sickness and infirmity and disease. But a spirit of infirmity, spirit of infirmity, uh, can definitely uh, cause you to, to have periodic and regular battles with all sorts of things. Um, you know, there's a lot of scriptures. I mean, um, I'm not going to turn to them, but, you know, if anybody wants to know the, the scripture, here, I'll just give you two right here quick. I'm not going to read them, but Mark chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. Uh, Luke 13, 11 through 13. Uh, both of those talk about Jesus casting out demons that heal people. Uh, you know, I mean, we've done a lot of deliverance over the last 20 or 30 years. Donna and I have, and, uh, you know, Diane's been a part of it, and Sue has helped us and others. Uh, and, you know, we haven't had, honestly, I haven't had huge success with casting out spirits of infirmity, but we have done it uh, in a, in a, in a, on occasion where a spirit of infirmity has actually been cast out. Uh, and so... You know, especially for those people where you have battled one thing after another most of your life or for a number of years. Here's, what, here's my challenge to you. What I want you to do, because we're going to pray for people, especially next week. If, if that's you, I want you to pray and, say, and ask the Lord to set me free. If I have a spirit of infirmity, a demonic spirit within me that's causing all this infirmity, I want to go free from it. And we'll pray for you next week. Uh, because I, uh, we could do it today, but really what I want you to do is I want you to deal with it. I want you to want it. I want you to believe it's possible. And I want you to ask God to set you free from it. And, he'll, and he, I believe he'll do that. I believe he'll do it next week. We pray. I believe he will do that. So a spirit of infirmity, uh, you know, you can pray for people. You know, Lord, we ask for you to heal them. We ask for that. But until you get rid of that spirit, you know, it doesn't do any good. I was talking to somebody the other day about, um, about deliverance and counseling. And I said, you know, you can't counsel demons. They got to be cast out. Uh, you, you know, they don't listen to you. You can come up with the most impressive set of things that need to take place uh, to get change, but the demon doesn't care. It's got to be cast out. And the same is true with the spirit of infirmity. You can pray healing, 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 but if there's a spirit of infirmity there, you've got to cast it out. That's the way you get healing. And so I want to challenge you uh, on that. Okay, and this next one is a big one too. Anger at God and others too, but we dealt with that with the unforgiveness and bitterness with others, but anger at God. You know, some people, because God has dealt with them bitterly in some ways or whatever, they get to the point that they get angry at God because he hasn't moved the way they want them, them, him to move. And so they get angry with him. But God is not moved by our anger. I want you to hear that. God is not moved by our anger. He's moved by faith, our faith, our trust. Our love. So if, there's, if you're angry, and angry might not even be related to an illness. It could be angry because of other things. It could be angry because of abuse as a young person. Or it can be uh, angry because of a marriage failure. It could be angry by any number of issues can cause you to be angry at God. But that can be an open door uh, to the enemy coming in in a lot of ways, but it, including uh, sickness and infirmity. So again, those doors need to be closed. You, we need to repent of that and, and deal with our anger toward God. Uh, because he, again, he is not moved by our anger. He's not moved by, to, by our being angry and say, I won't heal him because you haven't healed me. He's moved by our faith and our trust there of him. Um, 
I'm going to move this next one quickly. Generational sin and sickness. Uh, that can be an issue of, of sickness, and we just need to renounce that. Uh, and, you know, there may be some other prayers along with that, but, we, it, but that can be something that, that we need to renounce. Now, number six, um, I only got two more. This, uh, this is an important one, too. Accepting, acceptance of disease and infirmity. Accepting disease and infirmity can be a source where you don't get healed. Uh, you know, Jesus dealt with this in John chapter 5. You know, the, the guy by the pool of Bethesda, you know, and uh, he was there and, you know, every, every year there, an angel would come and bring healing and he would never, he would be there for 30, I think it was 38 years he was there and he never jumped in the pool first. Uh, and then Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? And finally he said, yes, I do. And then he was healed after that. Uh, now, we think, oh, I, I want to be healed. But, you know, do we really? You know, are we fighting the fight of faith to be healed? Or are we accepting it? I mean, any number of issues. I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, having some sort of infirmity is kind of like a badge of honor uh, kind of thing. And, uh, you know, other issues related to that. But we have to want it. We have to want it. I remember when I was in uh, seminary, it's a long time ago, there was a guy about my age uh, there, classmate, and he had just been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. And I was trying to talk to him about believing for healing and that type of thing. And his, his response to me was, he said, I believe that this disease is a gift of God to me. And I thought, I tried to talk, I said, you know, I, I must try talking to him, but no, it's disease is from the devil. It's not, it's not God doing this. Now, God may or may not heal him, but he needed to change his mindset. He didn't. He was thinking that he was thinking God was glorified through this, and uh, you know I don't know. I mean, we, I, after a while, I never saw him again, so I don't know what's went on with him. It's been a long time ago, but this is this is a fairly common thing, and we need to say no. This disease is not from God. I'm not going to tolerate it. I'm going to fight the fight of faith. Now, God is up to. You know, we can pray, we can believe, we can trust, but it's up to God to do what he wants to do. So I'm not saying it will automatically mean uh, healing, uh, but, I'm, but I guarantee you if you don't want it and don't try for it, you won't get healed by God from it. Uh, I mean, medicine or whatever may help or whatever, but whatever it is. But God wants us to, to fight that fight of faith. And what if it gets to the point where, you know, we can't have go use the medical system for whatever reason? We've got we've got to learn to live this way now. Uh, and I guarantee you, it's a lot better. It's a lot better than total dependency on the medical system without depending on God. Now, I you know I'm I'm very appreciative of the medical system. Very thankful for that. Uh, and, you know, I use doctors like you do. Uh, but I remember I'll use one, one example. Uh, I had this problem with my sciatic nerve and for uh, well over a year. And I went to the chiropractor, uh, you know, all the stuff that uh, she said I needed to do and all the, the chiropractor things. And finally she was referring me to the <laughs> to a uh, orthopedic type person, whatever kind of doctor deals with that, and and physical therapy and all that kind of stuff, because it was really painful. I mean, I could just trying to take the dog on a walk or whatever was very very painful uh, to do. Uh, and then, so I was trying to decide what to do because I didn't really want to fool with all that. Anyway, Terry Bennett came, uh, to, did a weekend conference. I don't remember what, exactly what year it was. Uh, but he had a word of knowledge that God was healing sciatic nerves. 
And, you know, there were a number of people, and several, several of them got healed instantaneously, it seemed like. But I didn't, and I was like, I was kind of getting, I wasn't angry at God, but I was getting disappointed that God didn't touch me. But two or three days later, during that next week, I started, wait a minute. It was kind of gradual. I didn't really know. It wasn't anything instantaneous. And I said, you know, my sciatic nerve is not hurting anymore. And, you know, I'm not saying, I mean, every once in a while I have a little tinge of it. But nothing really like it was. So I thank God for that. Uh, so, it's, you know, but we need, to, we need to form this paradigm where we believe God is our healer. And that, that whenever we have an issue, that we call upon him for that. Amen? Amen. Amen. I've been hoping this last one, this, I'm just going to really touch on this last one, but this is an important one. Uh, diet and lifestyle. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I need to call Donna up to t- talk about this one, actually. Yes. <laughs> she is my Holy Spirit when it comes to diet and lifestyle. What are you doing? What are you eating there? <laughs> it's amazing. I can, that can be a, piece of candy, chocolate, in the closet or something. And I get it out. Donna's like three rooms away. And as soon as I pick it out, get it like this, she walks in the room. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> but I'm doing better. I'm on an intermittent fasting diet right now. I've been, on, I've been on every diet. I've been on the cabbage soup diet, the uh, keto diet, the uh, Atkins diet. <laughs> <laughs> the eat everything, the seafood diet, that's my favorite. Uh, but anyway, enough of all that. But, <laughs> but it really does, it really is important, uh, you know, the lifestyle and eating healthy and all those kind of things are important too because they can really open the door. Uh, so it's not just like you can live any way you want to and, and then call on God to heal. You know, that's, that's not uh, at all what it's about. You know, God has given us our bodies as the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we need to, you know, honor that, it, you know, and pursue him in that as well. So anyway. So anyway, let's stand up and let's, uh, let's pray and see what the Lord would have us uh, to do here. What I'm going to... I'm on, um, I, mean, I know several, a couple of people have asked um, if we could pray for them this week because they're going to be out of town or whatever next week. So if, you, if, you, if you're not going to be here next week, we can pray for you for sicknesses. But uh, mainly we want to do that next week. Uh, but what I do want to deal with uh, before we move to any to the healing part, I want to deal with if there is either anger at God uh, or if there's bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart uh, towards someone, then I want you to come to the front. When I, I'll pray here first for everybody, but then I want you to come to the front. We want to minister over you there. And it, maybe there's not anybody, but I kind of felt like those two things, you really need, there, there really will be some people that need to get ministry uh, there. Uh, the spirit of infirmity we're going to deal with next week. Because I want you to deal with that privately this week. I want you to do that, and I want you uh, to go free uh, uh, and ask the Lord to go free for that, we pray. So if you've got one of those other things, angry at God or bitterness and unforgiveness, come to the front right now. I wanna, but I want to pray. Let me just pray a general prayer. And then you can come up. Father, we, we ask, Father, for the mighty move of your spirit. We ask that we would be allowed to close the door to the enemy, Lord, that we might walk in health and healing. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen.